Welcome to another episode of the Reboot Chronicles, a no holds barred forum with global leaders, authors, entrepreneurs, and CEOs about how organizations stay focused on growth and innovation in unprecedented times. I'm your host, Dean DeBias, coming to you live from Revive's North American headquarters in Chicago, and we would like to thank you for joining us from around the globe today. I'd like to welcome Ted Colbert, the CEO of Boeing Global Services. The world's largest aerospace company, Boeing develops, manufactures, and services commercial airplanes, defense products, and space systems, something we'll talk about, for customers in more than 150 countries, pretty widespread. As America's biggest manufacturing exporter, which I love, uh, Boeing employs about 140,000 people around the globe in 65 countries who last year generated over $62 billion in revenue. So uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good um, coming out of the pandemic there. The, um, but Ted was named one of the most influential black executives in corporate America. Uh, he also though was just awarded the 2022 Black Engineer of the Year Award by Black Engineer in IT Magazine, which recognizes top leaders that who have expanded opportunities for African-Americans in STEM programs. So we'll talk about that as well. One of my hot buttons as many of you know. Ted, it's good to see you and congratulations on the, the uh, Engineer of the Year Award. It's uh, quite a big honor. Thank you. It's good to see you as well. And thank you for having me. A pleasure to be with you today and looking forward to our chat. Yeah, we have some fun stuff to talk about. I think you were also um, one of the first recipients of the Fisher Center Prize at Berkeley and named one of the most powerful executives in the corporate mayor by Black um, Enterprise Magazine, if I, uh, if I got my facts straight. So, um, yes. You've been, uh, you've been very busy. fortunate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, busy and lots of opportunities. So, very, very fortunate. And I love it. it. Appreciate all. It, yeah, so maybe I thought a good place to start with was would be Global Services, rather impressive group, about 300 locations, 70 countries that you're managing around the world. Um, but what I love about it the most, it's got a very compelling kind of a customer centric approach, which many companies don't. I think other industries should pretty, you know, look at adopting more of what you're doing. Um, and very simple, you know, you're servicing competitive platforms. You're actually servicing not just your own uh, products, but those of your competitors. And um, to me, it seems extremely compelling to clients um, and it's, uh, probably a smart growth strategy too. So yeah, let's start with that. How's it going? So it's going well, and uh, it's really important to go just back just a little bit. Yes. We formed Boeing Global Services back in 2017 by taking... Uh, the best of what was commercial services out of our commercial business and the best of what was defense services out of our defense business, both domestic and international. And since 2017, we've been working really hard to both take advantage of the synergy to bring those businesses together, but serve our customers even better. Um, uh, our mission is to keep the world's fleet flying safely and efficiently through data-driven innovation. And that sentence is jam-packed with all kinds of good. That is a mouthful. That's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. You know, and so the first pillar of, uh, you know, our strategy, you know, we use strategy in corporate world a lot, uh, but mm. we, we really need to bring it to life. And it's back to your point, which is around having this customer-centric focus. Um, we put the customer in front of everything that we do, um, and we are deliberately and have deliberately uh, designed our services to some key segments that serve our customers. That's around supply chain, it's around training and professional services, it's around engineering and global technical operations, it's digital and data analytics, and then we have a specialty products and services group. So uh, we believe that uh, our domain platform knowledge around the world is unrivaled. Uh, that allows us to provide those customer-centric solutions. And we also believe that the future future is very digital and uh, we're focused on being a digital innovation hub that really amplifies all those what I'll call enduring and proven capabilities in the services world but makes them that much better for our customers uh, to pursue their mission. So um, so that that's sort of what BGS is uh, at a very, very high level. Um, as you said, we operate around the world, 70, country, 70 countries and um, you know, ha enjoy enjoy serving our customers, both commercial and defense. Yeah, and some some uh, you know Fortune one hundreds have learned or stumbled into some of them, but uh, you know that their services sector can actually make more money. Their gross margins sometimes are higher, not always. But um, 
And, and I see such a benefit in working. I'd love to be able to work on my competitors' products because I can take them apart and figure it out and see, <laughs> take them back to my engineers. But you're you're not doing like you know little digital servers. Um, when people say you know this isn't rocket science, this is rocket science because you, you're working on some extremely technical, extremely sensitive life and death type of equipment. Um, a lot yeah. of a uh, lot of responsibility. That um, is it. Is it like a lot of these um, airlines and governments are? Do they view you as like, hey, we're just outsourcing all of this to you because you know we we have this level of trust with you, or are you more of an augmentation, or is it all just situational? You know, uh, I would say, I'd say both on the commercial and the defense side of our business, uh, they are very very strong partnerships. Uh, we are part of their ability to serve their customers, and so we have to move at a pace. Uh, that supports the dynamic nature of their customers, whether it's commercial or defense. Yep. And uh, we also have to make sure that all the focus that we have around safety and quality in the development of our products uh, continues down the long life cycle of those products. So, you know, safety and quality being, you know, a foundational part of how we build is also how we take advantage of uh, supporting our customer uh, in the long term, or 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 say partner with them, you know, to that mission. So we're very integrated with them, and uh, you know, it is in some ways in our parts business, for example, you could call that more transactional because it is transactional. Uh, sure. But for from from the perspective of most of, of our portfolio, it, it is a strong partnership with uh, with our customers. Shift to you. You know, when I think of Boeing, I think of huge planes, hardware, a lot of, lot of, lot of moving parts going around. Yet you rose up more in the tech analytics side of the business, which we all know is very attractive right now. But how does that fit into the present, really the future of Boeing? And um, you know, you mentioned it's all about digital, but but uh, from uh, your career trajectory, it's uh, it's an interesting fit. Absolutely. Um, so if you think about uh, the way our world has evolved over the last several years and frankly decade, um, digital has really been a part of uh, everything that's grown and most things that, that have grown and grown really well. Um, that is not, um, not unlike the aerospace industry. You could say that we've been doing work in digital and aerospace and defense for a really long time. Uh, but just like other industries, whether it's consumer products or the telecoms world or automobiles, uh, the technology exists today in a way that allows it to be adopted faster and scaled more effectively across a broad and wide variety of problems that have to be solved. And so if you just simply take uh, from an inside kind of enterprise corporate perspective, the right. value stream of how our products are developed and delivered you know, from design to engineering to manufacturing to the supply chain uh, to delivery, and then you add in the services uh, element of, of our products, there are opportunities to solve problems in every dimension of that value stream. Uh, there are ways to provide data and solutions to help uh, folks that work in that value stream make decisions uh, with more clarity, make faster decisions, um, support predictive needs of the customer in the services world, uh, we have a ton um, of, of examples where we've used predictive capabilities to help improve the operational performance uh, of our customers' fleets, um, improve you know, crew scheduling uh, on the commercial side, improve fuel optimization, uh, helping with our defense customers in their mission readiness uh, and capability, cost for flight hour, all the metrics that make sense to them. So. In, in any way you think about it, if you take a business metric that drives your business and the thing that you describe is what success looks like, and you go all the way back to how you do the work, uh, right. we can think of and we can ideate and innovate around digital to make things that much better. It's amazing. The, um, let's shift to, uh, speaking of rocket science, one of my favorite topics is uh, space. Sure. Maybe go, let's go there first sure. and we'll come, we'll come back down to Earth later. But um, it's just it's just fascinating. I just came from the CES show of 2022, and it's it's there was a lot of the you know what I call startups, but a lot of emerging growth companies are, are getting into space, and a lot of outsourcing uh, just seems to be booming. There's no shortage of these emerging companies that are doing the heavy lifting for the USA's space programs, and um, so I'm just curious how 
you know, how's that going for Boeing? What's next? Um, are you doing stuff on your own? When you look at this like build by borrow type of matrix that we look at at Kellogg, it's like, you, know, you guys are used to building your own stuff. Now you're investing in companies and other things, which is good. But um, so just interested in two things, your approach to, 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 to space, um, which has mostly been more on probably your, your government side, but and then uh, more personally, you know, what, what does space travel look like over the next uh, couple of decades? You know, is it going to be like Apple where it's like, uh, you know, flights for the rest of us type of thing? Or um, is it still going to be kind of just a little, a little tiny market for uh, space travel? That's a good question. Well, look, first, uh, Boeing, as you know, hopefully all of our listeners know, Boeing has been in the space business for a very long time. Big time. Uh, yeah. We've made... Um, amazing contributions to uh, the space programs here, and that will continue and it has continued. Um, our team continues to contribute to the International Space Station. Uh, we obviously have work with uh, the Space Launch System and, and the Starliner, and uh, we have launch services and satellite continuing uh, to move forward. And then we have a bunch of other um, you know, activities that we don't talk about quite as much, obviously. Uh, but I see us continuing to be, you know, in this in this business. Uh, we have a very important place to uh, play in the future of space. Um, we frankly spend time serving our customer NASA, you know, largely uh, in this dimension of the industry. We stay very very close to NASA and, and make sure that we are a formidable option for uh, whatever the needs of space are going forward. We recognize. Um, and frankly, it's important that there's competition, uh, healthy competition in, 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 this, uh, in this domain. And, um, and we all take different approaches uh, to getting things done. And frankly, that's a good thing. Uh, it's better for NASA, the country and the world. It helps drive innovation uh, and it allows us all to get to, you know, whatever those objectives are, um, you know, at the right pace, obviously. I'll just continue to say with safety and quality first, right? Um, and so um, yeah, it, it is tends, It tends to be a thing when you're strapping yourself to a rocket. I exactly. Suppose, this is, it's, it's very hard work. Our, our, you know, our, I've, uh, I've, been to, I've been to the Houston Space Center many yeah. times and actually you see your, your people are always walking around there. It's like the, the level of specificity yeah. is mind blowing what has to get done. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and, and the timelines are exhausting how long these timelines are. Oh gosh, the timelines are amazing because it is it is that precise and and so um, that's and so we we will always put safety and quality first. Um, we will you know learn from uh, our history and past and and many many years of being in this industry and uh, and we'll continue to contribute in, in big ways. So I, I just I don't see that changing anytime soon and uh, really encouraged by the team's work. Now you know commercial space travel. Um, yeah. you know, when can I we'll book a see, flight? You know? <laughs> we'll see. I don't know. Um, I will. I will go. You know, <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's one of those things that again that will that it will continue to evolve. You know, we've got to all, um, you know, we've got to get it right. Uh, obviously, from a scale up perspective on all the technologies that have to be in place. Um, you know, we have a regulatory environment. We have. Uh, we have the cultural element of, you know, people being comfortable with it. Um, there's a, obviously a cost element and scale around that. There, there are a bunch of things that we'll all learn more about over the next couple of decades. And, and those things will be the things that really pace, you know, the growth of, of the commercial space travel. Business. And, and frankly, that's the way there's no, nobody needs to be in a rush to do this. Um, right. You know, right. we just need to do it right. You know, take, the, it needs take to be that, done take right. that, Bezos. Yeah. Anyway, um, so <laughs> uh, sorry, Jeff. The uh, so let's all right. Let's bring it down to earth then. Um, so uh, sure. what? Let's talk about how Boeing is going to, as you said, kind of power the Jetsons' age. Uh, those of you, I just yeah. just I just distance ourselves from half the audience. They're like, what are they talking about? But the uh, <laughs> so so tell us about tell. Let's pick on one. Uh, tell us about like the autonomous uh, uh, air taxi company. So Whisk Aereo, uh, Boeing just yeah. made an additional four hundred fifty million dollar uh, investment there. Some good good cash there. It is an intensely competitive market. Uh, these, yeah. these these industry players are coming after each other, heavily funded sector. And you've got analysts predicting, you know, mass market adoption and travel forecasts within the next decade. And just for listeners, we're talking about unmanned large drone type of uh, 
uh, aircraft flying around cities and things like that. I'm not sure what the distance range is, but uh, so question is, um, you know, what's your strategy there? What's going on? Yeah, so um, I, you know, I was I was fortunate enough to go visit uh, this group uh, several years ago, and they have some that really must have been fun. <laughs> yes. uh, oh, it was fun. Yeah, it was. Fun. In fact, I was looking for my pictures from it. I couldn't quite find them. I sat in one of the early vehicles. Uh, it, it was, you know, when you sit in the in this thing, you think to yourself, "Wow, you know, would I really, you know." Sit in this thing, flying, you know. But I put my height. children I, in here is always the test question. <laughs> you know. Well, exactly. maybe one of them, but not that other one. <laughs> no, just kidding. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so I think that, I think that, you know, the excitement about this is that there is a lot of opportunity uh, in this world going forward. Um, you know, from a, a demand perspective, there are lots of ways to apply the technology. Um, you know, and so if you think about the ability to take uh, a company that's been innovating in the space for a while um, mm -hmm. and then uh, couple it with a company like ours that obviously continues to innovate all over the place, uh, but has a lot of experience in building uh, these types of vehicles, um, you know, the regulatory aspects of them, the safety aspects of them, um, and, and sort of brings that all together. The strategy is that over time, you know, we will be able to deliver uh, a set of capabilities and products and services around it uh, that that fill the space of need. And um, and so with a you know one team mindset around it, um, the, this this is a space for a lot of innovation, uh, both from a kind of a, a an innovative valley, you know, new co early stage company perspective, but also bringing forward all that knowledge and expertise that that Boeing brings to play here. So um, I'm excited about it. Uh, we've got some great people there again that I've spent some time with. Uh, and, and you know, I think I'll just say the sky is going to be the limit with them. So <laughs> I think yeah. they're going to do some great work. Good one. Yeah. Well, I mean, it makes sense. You know, Ford and GM early on started investing in some of the autonomous stuff and some of the uh, heavy duty telematics companies. So it makes sense for you guys not to do this all on your own and, you know, yeah, pl yeah, place absolutely. your bets as it will. And, and uh, it's, uh, it seems like it's, um seems like the timelines are gonna be a little longer. Everyone's always asked me, you know, when are we gonna have autonomous driving cars? And 10 years ago, I said, it's gonna be like 20 years. It's like, you just rattled off all of the same issues, except nothing's even flying. These are on the ground, so everything regulatory to, you name it. I mean, we've, we've been through this over and over. So I always tell people, you know, the Jetsons uh, still isn't here. Um, and now everyone's saying it's coming. And I, we get people so excited about stuff. And we're like, well, wait till the next CES show in Vegas. We're going to show you what's really coming. And then that doesn't happen. <laughs> and when well, I said coming, I, I meant 10 years from now. We'll be here. That's what I meant to say. Oh, OK. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And we have to get people excited about it. It's so important because. Absolutely. As, Especially when we investors. Get people, oh, investors, talent, and the like. Um, it's the only way we really make progress is through the experimentation and learning process that we go through. And that requires talent and investment. So to your point, we, we've got to continue to do that. There's opportunity there. That's a good segue. Speaking of talent, so, uh, you know, I am a big, uh, you know, supporter and mentor of all types of students at different you know, age levels up to, up to grad school and beyond. And uh, we have actually have a reboot fellows program for, for people that are actually out in the workforce to kind of work on things and reboot themselves and pivot into other companies or careers. But, you know, you, mm -hmm. Ted, um, you know, you're also a very inspirational uh, civic leader who gives back, I think, big, big time to multiple communities. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the 2022 uh, Black Engineering um, uh, Year, Engineer of the Year um, Award, I think, is, is that's another opportunity for you just to inspire all kinds of students to focus on STEM. I mean, the focus of that is how do you enable people for, you know, STEM and, um, so any advice for aspiring students that really want to be part of this exciting future, whether it's drones or rockets or planes or services, um, maybe not, they don't always have to be engineers, but uh, yeah, what would you say to, to those listening in on the, that are trying to figure out where they should go in their careers? Yeah, absolutely. So I love inspiring youth and frankly, even not just the youth, but anyone to 
uh, to sort of dig into this world. The world. You're, you're inspiring then, me right now, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's an exciting world. Um, it is. You know, one of the things I told a group of students in Chicago once, I asked them, you know, how many of you all are really good at, at you know, arithmetic and math? And, and you know, like half of their hands raised up. And I said, for the other half, is the reason why you're not interested in science and engineering because you don't think you can do simple math real well? And some of them raised their hand. And, and I said, look, hmm. this world is not just about being good at math. It's about being a great problem solver. Engineers, what we do is we solve problems. And it takes a lot of people with a lot of different skills to solve problems. People that understand culture, and how people operate and their behaviors, along with people that understand, you know, the traditional elements of physics and engineering, along with people that understand to the point we made earlier around how to uh, work with the regulatory environment around us so that we can bring innovation, you know, to life. So, you know, I'd encourage anyone to think about what your passions are, you know, kind of figure out what your superpowers are over time. Um, and figure out how you can apply them to something fun and technical. And when you're starting off, the most important thing that you can do is expose yourself to a whole bunch of different things. So you can figure out what all those things are. Um, I encourage our early uh, employees to uh, do different job rotations to learn more about what they like and what they don't like and understand more about the technologies and the diversity of all the work that we do. I did the same thing when I worked in the auto industry. Um, I was lucky enough to start in a rotational program where um, I learned a ton about different uh, different technologies and different parts of the industry. And that was a and, Ford. Uh, and you find your way. Yeah, it was a Ford. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, they're really good at that. Those rotating programs. Um, yeah. You, you know, you just brought up something that most people don't touch on. It's like if they are, if these are younger students you were talking to in Chicago. So, hey, if you're, if you're, are you afraid of math or you don't, you know, think you're that good yeah. at it, it's like you can still be in the tech sector. There are so many jobs yeah. in the tech sector that are still techie, you know, user experience design, ethnography, um, you know, all different types of support in the, in the technology sides that you don't have to be a, a programming genius to do those types of things. So, I, I think that is really good advice to like make them feel more comfortable but not not to um um sorry i got excited i hit the boom sometimes but not to lower their expectations you know still try to work on your math skills sure. but don't sure. think that sure. that's a gate it used to be a gate that would close now sure seems like it's much more flexible and open i mean you have so many jobs we used to going. have this archetype yes we used to have this archetype around the techie that was not very inclusive and so exactly. in the world that we're in now, and because of the need for so many people in this field, we sort of have to get rid of that old archetype and make it more inclusive so that people, that everyone feels like they can play in this world. And that, so that is a great I point. Think that, you know, you know when, you and I, when, I, when you and I grew up, you couldn't, you, you wouldn't even go near the CTO's office. It was like the CFO's like, by the way, if, yeah, if you want to get it, if you want to get into the CFO stack, you do need to be good at math, but not if you want to get yeah. to Ted's world, you don't have to be. I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That could be an interesting um, shift here. Just speaking of, you know, Chicago and things, um, you know, we were talking off, off camera, the, uh, I'm one of the uh, board members, founders of uh, 1871, one of the largest incubators in the world. And we, um, you know, nurture startups. They're anywhere from four to 500 in a given uh, quarter. And, uh, you know, the target is about 30% are uh, black founders. We've got uh, mm -hmm. uh, Latinos and as well as women uh, cohorts as well. Anywhere in the 20 to 30% of, um, so really like engaging and getting people to realize that, hey, you too can be a startup founder. It's not like a Silicon Valley thing that has to happen. This is 10 years later now, it's it's just booming. But um, so I, I find it to be very diverse because Chicago is diverse. I go to other cities, I don't see that and it's okay. But um, my question to you is more about, you know, so many companies kind of struggle with diversity and inclusion uh, efforts, especially when it comes to engineering, right? You just brought it up. It was like, it was a very restrictive world. It was like working at the phone company years ago, um, which I just lost half the audience again, but it's okay. <laughs> it was a very, <laughs> it was a very, you know, a, a very different kind of engineering organization. So I guess two questions. How is, how is your work about, around that going at Boeing? I've heard good things. And what are some of the serious challenges and triumphs you've, uh, you've had there? Yeah, so uh, we've been at this for as long as I've been at the company. 
Uh, and obviously the last couple of years or so for all big companies like ours um, have provided an opportunity for us to you know, amplify the work that we had been doing for a long time and accelerate uh, a lot of that work to get to more results. And so uh, we've done a ton of things to get the acceleration going. Uh, we have a racial equity task force, for example, that's made up of a broad group of diverse, talented employees across the company. Um, they represent all of our employee resource groups and all of our business units and functions and others. Uh, they've been providing input for uh, the targets and approach that we've been taking. Target, I don't mean, I don't mean that in, a, in an old school like way of you know creating targets to hire people. I mean yeah. we're trying to figure out from a business perspective what we need to do to move forward on diversity, equity, inclusion, and specifically make progress on racial equity. Um, that's black representation. That's how we interview and staff interviews um, and, and seed the pipeline of talent uh, across the organization. It's how we work with our communities. It's one of my favorite efforts that um, I sponsored and helped develop early on, our partnership with HBCUs and using that as another pathway to access uh, broad and diverse talent. Um, it's within the company holding people accountable when they don't treat uh, people the right way um, in a way that we hadn't necessarily done um, as strongly before. And, uh, yep. and so uh, well, there, there's the tech a industry is uh, nowhere near that. Yeah. So you guys are way ahead of the tech sector. Yeah. Yeah. So we, so we're proud of the progress we've made, um, you know, over the last several years and even before uh, the programs, the HBC program with Thurgood Marshall college fund is doing really well. Uh, mm -hmm. We have employees who started in the first cohort that are now being hired and are strong, talented, contributing professionals. Uh, the work that we've been doing to improve our hiring um, has shown an increase in numbers. You'll see we'll publish um, our next uh, report here uh, sometime soon, uh, which I think is, uh, which will show progress, but it'll also show opportunities for us because this is real. Like, you know, you can't, un you can't fix and unwind you know, decades or centuries worth of uh, inequity in, in, the, in, the, in two years. It's just not that simple, you know? Well, and, um, and there's a <laughs> thing called talent too. You need certain skill sets for people. And there's, if there's not enough in a sector, there's not enough. Yeah. I mean, I was talking to one of the, the uh, top execs at uh, Bosch the other day in Chicago. They're a big employer in Chicago. They're looking for 500 developers. And I said, he's like, can you help us? I'm like, uh, well, yeah, of course I can, you know, <laughs> I can obviously get the word out, but, um, you know, welcome to the club. Good luck with that. And you're not the most attractive company to work for in the world. You are people that know what you're, what you have capability wise, like even Boeing, a lot of people don't know. Once they find out, they're like, wow, you guys have some amazing technology, but I see a lot of these companies struggling because they are, so far behind the hiring curve of tech, but this one is clearly developers um, that, and it's hard to like work on diversity and inclusion when you've got, they've got some big numbers to, uh, to hire you know, just to stay competitive. Yeah. yeah. No, it is, uh, hiring is, is uh, very competitive these days at all levels, um, especially with everyone's focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so you have to uh, participate in that talent economy, um, you know, and show up. You've got to make it clear what your mission is. Uh, you've got to have demonstrated performance in developing talent broadly and specifically. Um, and, uh, and recognize and show, you know, one of our values that we talk about and priorities in the company is around diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's a force multiplier for the performance of any team. It helps us make better decisions. It uh, helps us solve big problems, um, and it shows up in everything that we do. And um, if you haven't, and, and you have, if you haven't figured that out, then your um, your the probability that you're going to actually attract talent is is almost nil uh, because your leaders have to recognize that they need to have diverse talent to be better. Your leaders have to recognize the demographic of our country and the world is changing, and therefore uh, the ability to great get great talent is going to be predicated upon whether they, we have an environment that reflects the world that we live in and the, the evolving and changing needs, desires, and cultural requirements of, of the, the population that's coming with inside of the workforce. So uh, on both ends of the spectrum, leadership has got to get real about you know, how we focus on, and it, it's got to be 
part of real life and not just the thing that we do, um, you know, as an added part of, uh, you know, our metrics. It's, well it's got to be inculcated in everything we do. And it's really from the front line all the way to the boardroom. I spend most of my, uh, my work on, on DEI on the boardroom sector, but for multinational companies like you, it's very different because many of the, many of these companies, they're not walking the talk, they're just talking. And, you know, and they've got yeah. a lot of catching up to do, and they could probably learn a lot from you if you're okay with some of these multinationals reaching out to you personally, because they could get a little coaching from you guys, because you have been on it for a long time. I mean, since you moved to Chicago years ago, we attracted you guys to come there. And you guys have been through some up and downs and had some, you know, leadership mm -hmm. issues and, you know, who hasn't, but you jumped in on it early for necessity, not for like trying to be, a, you know, trying to jump on the trend later on. So I think that's good advice. I, uh, I hope people can actually reach out to you and uh, kind of get your uh, learn from you because I, I think companies need to figure out some shortcuts here to make up for you know a lot of the years that have been <laughs> kind of wasted and not building the right programs. But Ted, um, unfortunately yeah. we're out of time again. But I just uh, really appreciated having you on. You've uh, been a, a great uh, um, influence on, on young people. Continue to be, and uh, when you get your uh, your awards term, I think it's coming up pretty soon here. The um, I think there's a whole uh, bunch of students that are going to want to listen to this and reach out to you. You might get inundated with emails, just so you know. But any uh, any, <laughs> any, any parting any uh, parting words for uh, for the audience? Well, first, um, it's been a pleasure to be with you, and thank you for the opportunity to share. Um, I think sharing is so important. My first supervisor, Ford, actually told me one of the reasons he knew I'd be successful is because I'm so generous about sharing. Uh, it's how we learn from one another. Uh, it's how we develop empathy for one another in, in sort of the products and services that we deliver. It's how we uh, go and listen to our customers and understand how we get to them the things that they really, really want. Um, sharing and listening and speaking and speaking and, you know, listening to people around you makes all the difference in the world. And hopefully today there's something interesting that, uh, you know, your listeners got out of the discussion. Um, I'm excited about Boeing's future. I'm extremely excited about Boeing Global Services' future. Um, our future is around digital innovation, keeping our customers' uh, planes flying every single day uh, using great, great capabilities and a great, great squad of talent in BGS that we right. deal with every single day. Keep those, keep those planes flying. We appreciate it. You've been listening to Ted Colbert, who is the CEO of Boeing Global Services. This is Dean Tobias with the Reboot Chronicles. I want to thank you for joining us today, and we will see you soon.